having a barbecue used to be pretty simple. There was a time when you could just get together with some mates, put some sausages, some chops, maybe some chicken on the barbecue, cook it up, and then eat it with some salads with your friends. These days, I'm kind of finding that a barbecue is not that simple. You see, my wife and I have an increasing number of friends who, for one reason or another, don't eat meat. They've decided to become vegetarian or vegan. I can understand the reasons for doing that, and so in, in no way am I critical of anyone who makes a choice like that to become vegan or vegetarian. I totally support the decisions that you make. From my perspective, though, when it comes to organising a barbecue, it can become a little more complicated. For example, do I just cook my sausages or my chops or my meat, whatever I'm making, and when people who are vegan or vegetarian come over, do I just expect them to do what I'm doing and to eat the food that I've cooked for them because that's what I do? Or do I change what I do? Do I give up what I like, the meat that I enjoy eating? Do I give that up and look for vegetarian or vegan recipes so that they can participate in the meal? Or do I just not invite them over at all? That is an option, something we could consider. So when we're dealing with differences in opinion, differences on, on perspectives, either we can do what we do and expect others to fit in with us, we can make a change in ourselves, we can give up something that's important to us in order to, to accommodate them, or we can just go our separate ways and do our own thing. There are a couple of times in the New Testament when Paul writes letters to early Christian churches who are really grappling with what it means to have people in their communities who eat different things. One of these passages is 1 Corinthians 8. See, what was happening in the early church in Corinth was that there were people who, through their faith in Jesus, were able to eat anything. And so they would sit down with people who had sacrificed meat to an idol and they would share in that food with them. They would eat that sacrificial meat with them. And they could do that in good conscience because of their faith in Christ. There were others in the church, though, who weren't able to do that in good conscience. For them, sacrificing that meat to an idol was an act of worship. And so because of the way in which they understood the Christian faith, to actually eat that meat that sacrificial meat was breaking the first commandment because they believed that they were worshipping another god. So the problem came when people who couldn't eat this meat saw people who were eating that meat and they felt bad a bit about what they were doing. And so they are actually led to and encouraged to go against their conscience, to do something that they believed was wrong and eat this sacrificial meat. The way that Paul describes it, those who were eating the meat we're encouraging those who didn't want to eat the meat in good conscience to go against their conscience, to stumble in their faith and ultimately to sin. What's important here is, is Paul's understanding of sin. You see, sin wasn't in this case so much doing something that was wrong, but it was going against their conscience, not doing something in good faith. When Paul addresses a similar situation in Romans chapter 14, in Romans 14, 23, he says that whatever is not done in faith is sin. And so when these people who were acting in good faith was encouraging others to go against their conscience and not do something in good faith, their faith, their faith suffered and they resulted in sin. What I find fascinating about what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8 is that he doesn't come out and say that the people who are eating meat are right and the others are wrong. He doesn't say that those who don't want to eat the meat are right and the others are wrong. He does give a theological assessment. He says a, a, a few things, for example, in verses 5 and 6. He says that even though there are so-called gods, yet for us there is one God. And so these idols which are worshipped as gods really are nothing. And so they hold no power. A little bit later on in verse 8, he says that food doesn't bring us near to God. And so we're no worse if we do eat and we're no better if we don't. And so Paul is making it pretty clear that the way in which he understands the gospel is that we are free, which he talks about more in, in 1 Corinthians 9, the freedom that we have. For Paul, what was at issue, though, was not the behaviours themselves. 
not the eating or the not eating, but the way in which one person's actions were influencing another and whether the freedom that one person was living in was actually leading another person into sin. And so he doesn't say what's right or what's wrong in terms of the eating, but he ends up this, this part. He ends up the, at the end of the chapter and he says some of the, what I find to be the most amazing words, the most amazing examples of Christ-like love that we find in the New Testament. Paul says that if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Could you imagine doing that? Could you imagine never eating meat again if it caused someone who was a non-meat eat meater, who was someone who was a vegetarian or vegan, if it was to build up their faith in the grace of Christ? Could you imagine making that promise to never eat meat again if it was a stumbling block to them? And so what Paul's doing here is he's asking us to think about our actions and the way in which they might lead other people into an obstacle in their faith or to lead into sin. And to ask ourselves whether or not we can actually build people up in faith rather than just think about what's good for us. Because he's already said in verse 1 that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so whether we can build up people in Christ-like love through what we do, and by being willing to give up what's important to us, even if that means never eating meat again. And so this whole question about our actions, the influence they have on others, the the witness they give to our faith and, and the grace that we find in Christ, and itself being an example of grace, is something we can apply to a lot of different areas in the church. Because just like my barbecues, we live in a, in a time of increasing differences. People see things differently. And in my experience in the church, our, our sort of our usual reaction to that is to go to the Bible and try to work out who's right and who's wrong, who's doing the right thing, who's doing the wrong thing, whose theological interpretation is correct, and who maybe has it wrong. And what ends up happening is, is an argument which doesn't get resolved. Like I said, there are a number of ways in the church we can talk about this. For this particular message, I'm going to focus on just one. You see, for three decades, in our church, we've been arguing about whether or not women can be ordained into the public ministry of word and sacrament. And I'm not going to go over the arguments again. I'm sorry if you're not familiar with this discussion in in the Lutheran Church in Australia and New Zealand. There are documents that I can refer you to which can give you more information. But it's basically come down to the interpretation of two key texts. And from my perspective, as I've listened for 30 years to the arguments backwards and forwards on both sides, it seems to me that the assumption that we have going into this conversation is that one group is right and one group is wrong. It's similar to trying to say to the people in Corinth, yes, those who are eating or not eating meat are right, and those who are not eating or eating meat are wrong. The way in which we try to resolve these these, or this particular discussion is to try to work out who's correctly interpreting scripture and who's not. And what's resulted is that we have a stalemate which nobody really knows how to overcome. Personally, I'm wondering if there's a different kind of conversation we can have about ordination in our church, which isn't based on who's reading scripture right or who's doing the right thing, but instead, how do we love each other through this? Because it seems to me, and I'm really happy if you'd like to comment on this and and maybe correct me if you believe I'm wrong, it seems to me that 1 Corinthians 8 can speak directly into our conversation on ordination. Because maybe it's not as simple, maybe it's more simple than just who's doing the right thing and who's doing the wrong thing. Who has the correct understanding of Scripture and who doesn't. Maybe instead we need to go back to what Paul says about building each other up in love. Now, I'm I'm not going to identify one group or the other as the ones who are so-called weak in faith. Because let's face it, if our church decides to ordain women, we are going to be asking people who believe that Scripture prohibits that, we're going to be asking them to go against their conscience. But just that we don't ordain women already is already asking people who believe that scripture permits it to go against their conscience. And so the dilemma that we find ourselves in, the struggle, the the challenge that we have, is no matter what we decide to do, we're going to be asking people to go against their conscience. 
Now, this is a matter of faith. And Paul says that what's important is not the correct theology or the right behaviours, because ultimately the correct theology, as Paul says in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith showing itself through love. And so what if we had a different conversation about ordination? What if instead of trying to work out who's theologically correct or not, what if we started thinking more about how are my actions and how is my perspective on this actually leading someone else into sin or encouraging someone into a stumbling block for their faith? How am I asking them to go against their conscience? And then how do I build up my sister or brother in Christ in faith by displaying grace to them, by embodying the grace of God to them in Jesus? And particularly with what Paul says then in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 8, and this becomes the real kick, the kicker to it, what am I willing to give up so that somebody else can experience the grace of Jesus through me and through my relationship with them. Because that's what Paul's about. When he says that he'd give up meat for the rest of his life if it became an obstacle to someone, he's basically saying that he's willing to sacrifice anything in order to encourage others in their faith. And this grows out of and is done in faith in the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Giving up meat isn't that big a deal when you think about the sacrifice Jesus gave made where he gave up his whole life for us on the cross and when we find our acceptance when we find our life when we find everything that we need in that when we find the grace of god that changes our lives through what jesus gave up for us then it leads us to ask so what am i willing to give up so that somebody else can encounter that grace in me for paul it was meat for us maybe it means giving up our determination to prove that we have the right understanding of ordination according to scripture. And maybe it means actually thinking about, instead of, look, forgive me if this language offends you, but instead of winning an argument, what if our primary focus was what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 8, how do we remove stumbling blocks for people's faith? How do we, how do we not ask them to go against their conscience, but how do we love them in a Christ-like way, being willing to sacrifice for them so that we can build them up in faith and love. To me, this leads to a completely different kind of conversation in our church. Instead of trying to argue who's right and who's wrong, who's got the correct theology or interpretation of Scripture, it comes back to how do we love each other in the faith that Christ sacrificed everything for us. From my way of thinking, it could lead to a whole lot more hopeful, life-giving, grace-filled, unifying conversations. When we start thinking more about how do we love each other through this in a Christ-like way to build each other up in faith, rather than how do we prove that we're right and how do we get what we want. I I know that that is not going to lead to any simple, clear-cut solutions to what we do in the church and how we work through this. Speaking personally, I would much rather be involved in the conversation in our church about how we remove obstacles to faith, how we stop asking people to live against their conscience and start thinking more about how do we build each other up in faith and in hope and love as sisters and brothers in Christ and as disciples of Jesus. It doesn't give us an easy answer, but I think it does give us a new and a different conversation that we can have in our church. So what would you do if you were having a barbecue? Would you cook your meat, invite your vegetarian and vegan friends over and expect them to do what you do? If you invited them over and if they accepted, would you... Be willing to give up what's important to you so that they can feel like they belong and they can participate in that kind of fellowship. Or do we just not invite them at all and let them go their own way? In our conversation around ordination, are we going to expect other people to fit in with the way we think? Are we going to be willing to give up what's important to us so that people can experience grace through us? Or are we just going to go our separate ways?
I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what God has for our church. I know what I do in a barbecue. What I'd like us to think about is how might we live out what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 in our relationships with each other and in our conversation around ordination in the church. Because in the end, sacrifice, what Jesus gave up for me, that's phenomenal. Giving up me, that's big enough. What Jesus gave up for me, that's massive. Because he loved me that much, because he showed me that much grace, how about we show that same kind of grace to each other, even if they believe something different? Believe with God's peace so that others can encounter his peace in you.